And uh, with that, I, I wanted to welcome everyone tonight and um, really appreciate everyone joining in and giving us a couple hours of your time. Uh, we, we really value your opinions and, and have had some great feedback uh, so far to date on this project. And I know we'll, we'll get a lot more great, excellent feedback this evening. Uh, this is session two of um, at least three public engagement sessions for the Flint River Restoration Project. Uh, the sessions being hosted by University of Michigan Flint and Kettering University uh, alongside Genesee County Parks. Um, so like I said, we're, uh, we're really excited to get moving tonight. Um, I do wanna mention the, the existing or the, the original online survey is still up. Um, it's on the Genesee County website and that's a survey monkey survey. And if you've already taken it, we, we appreciate it. If you haven't, uh, we encourage you to, to jump on there and, and take that online survey as that's very helpful for us as we move forward. So with that, uh, we will get, um, get started here and like to introduce our speakers for this evening. Uh, so my name is Scott Lotzenheiser. I'm a professional landscape architect with Wade Trim. I'm the uh, Riverbank Park uh, design manager for the Flint River Restoration Project. Uh, alongside me tonight is Katie Dennis, a professional landscape architect and uh, lead green associate with, uh, with Wade Trim, and Nate Trevithan with um, Michael Van Valkenburg, a principal there and a landscape architect. And um, he will be talking more in depth on the Chevy Commons uh, side of this project later in the presentation. So our agenda for tonight is uh, we wanted to do a, a brief project overview uh, for those of you that could not attend the first session um, that we did a few months ago um, to give everyone an idea of, of why we're doing this project and, and what it all includes and what's been done to date. Uh, we want to talk about the public input that we've received today, which has been just a fantastic amount of responses. We want to go into detail or into more detail on the actual river restoration project, both the in-river side as well as the uh, Riverbank Park improvements. And then uh, we, will, we will turn it over to Nate and he'll talk more about the future of Chevy Commons. Uh, we will have engagement throughout, similar to last time, our last engagement session. And uh, we're gonna have more of an open Q&A uh, at the end of, of uh, the presentation for Chevy Commons. So, this whole Flint River restoration project started about 15 plus years ago. Um, and, and there's been a lot of planning and, and fundraising and development that has occurred to date. Um, that project, the vision for it was that we would transform uh, a neglected resource into a healthy and vibrant community asset. And it called for the re rejuvenation of the river and riverfront through the creation of water-based recreational opportunities, park improvements, underutilized property redevelopment, enhanced community connectivity, ecosystem restoration, and improved stormwater and flood control. Um, and so that those planning studies, you know, we're gonna talk in more detail about how those impact, um, you know, the current vision and, and project goals and benefits uh, that came from those. Um, and it, those have really been uh, important beacons for us um, throughout the, the last decade plus as, as we're working towards, um, you know, each, each project along each step of the way, including those we're gonna talk in more detail about this evening. So generally those project goals and benefits that were identified were improved safety, improved water quality, more recreation, health benefits, and economic development. Um, last time we went in a lot of detail, since we have so much to cover tonight, we're gonna to, um, just, look at those at a high level and then we want to talk more about um, you know the project in itself so we want to move on to the the actual limits of the project which uh, has been roughly divided into um, three kind of three areas uh, on the left side of this graphic you'll see Chevy Commons um, and that has been undergoing remediation and, and greening over the past decade uh, with, with additional improvements um, coming in the near future. 
the downtown Riverbank Park blocks, which is uh, what we refer to as kind of the lower reach of the river work. Um, that includes Riverbank Park, uh, Swartz Creek Confluence in, in the Riverwalk, and then the upper reach project area, which is essentially from Hamilton Dam all the way up to Hamilton Avenue, and, and includes you know, the river work through that stretch, as well as some improvements to, to Vietnam Veterans Park. So within those areas, there's been a lot of work that's been done to date. Um, it started back eight years ago with, with Chevy Commons um, and, and the work that has occurred over those five phases. And the lower right image, you see a, a photo of that. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with, with that work and have, have gone through the 60 plus acres out there that's been restored. Um, there's also been some remediation on the, on the river uh, and the UNF Flint campus. Um, there's been the Hamilton Dam removal in the upper right corner. Um, those couple photos, which are, were really a key aspect and first, first part of this river restoration project uh, to remove that barrier. And then there was the downstream uh, Faber Dam removal uh, right after that. Uh, various stormwater outfall improvements to help improve water quality and, and reduce erosion. Um, the installation of the Iron Bell Trail and, and uh, bridge, which is shown in the lower left image. And then most recently, um, just this past few months, work has been completed on the Swartz Creek Confluence Project, um, which was a EPA grant funded project um, for green infrastructure. So there's been a, a permeable pavement, rain gardens, um, as well as an access point, which you so, see in the, the lower middle photo. Uh, including a kayak rail and kayak slide to help ease um, getting kayaks and canoes in and out of uh, Swartz Creek there at the confluence. So with that, we wanted to open it up to our first uh, engagement question. Um, and actually our first two engagement questions, the first being, what are your favorite memories about the Flint River? And then the second question, how do you currently use the riverfront? And as a reminder, um, as I'm not sure if everyone was on and, and heard this, but we, we prefer if you went to the web-based version uh, that, that has the most capabilities. So if you go to pollev.com slash COF community, or you can text COF community to 22333. And you should see, if you're on the web-based browser, you should be, be seeing this question right now um, and be able to input it. And once you do so, it, there's a, a slight lapse in time and it should pop right up on our screen and we'll actually be able to see responses. So we'll give, uh, you know, about a minute or a half, minute and a half or so, um, for, for everyone to respond. So some great comments being received so far. Um, Flotilla watching fireworks over the river, Jazz Fest, at Riverbank Park. Um, kayaking is, is definitely a, a favorite. And it seems like everyone that, that goes for the first time always says that, that how, how beautiful it is and how um, fun it was to kayak down the Flint River. And this could be, uh, you know, current memories or, or memories growing up, um, any, any experience um, that you've had throughout your, throughout your life involving the Flint River. All right, we'll give it about another uh, 15 seconds or so. We'll move on to the next question.
All right, we really appreciate those responses. So our next question um, is, how do you currently use the riverfront? We've already got a number of responses here, um, both you know along downtown, the Flint River Trail, Chevy Commons. And it, it can be the you know any stretch of the riverfront. We're, we're looking for um, how you like to use it, how you want to use it. Thank you very much for your responses. We'll, we'll give this one about another uh, 15 seconds or so before we, we move on here. There's a lot of things that, that you would expect to, to hear um, on use of the riverfront. All right, um, and with that, we are going to move on to our next um, section of our presentation, that's review of public input. Uh, and I'm gonna turn it over to Katie Dennis, and she's gonna go through that. Uh, Holly, if you would, please uh, unmute Katie for us. <clears throat> Thanks, Scott. And thanks to everyone who's tuning into the presentation tonight. Um, so to date, we've received over 400 responses to our online survey and also heard from additional folks in the last public engagement session. Tonight, we're gonna ask for, we're gonna ask more questions as the project continues to evolve. But first, we just wanted to go through some of the feedback that we've received to date. Um, so first we asked people to share their personal thoughts on the Flint River and the responses show that people have a real mix of emotions about the current state of the river. So on the screen, you can see some representative examples of the responses that we received to this question. Some folks called it underrated, beautiful, safe, um, and reflected on the river as a great resource. And others pointed out the recent improvements to habitat along the river corridor. Still others called the river somewhat neglected and described additional changes that they'd like to see. Um, as part of this project, we're trying to increase use of the riverfront and design improvements that contribute to positive feelings about the Flint Riverfront. Um, so next question we asked, please share your personal thoughts specifically on Riverbank Park um, in downtown Flint. So of the people surveyed, about three quarters of the respondents said that they have used Riverbank Park. And these are some of the representative examples of the responses that we got on their personal thoughts. Um, respondents, again, gave a wide range of responses about Riverbank Park, many referring to the park as a nice spot, but also pointing out some unmet potential in the park. Um, common responses mentioned that the park could be improved by being used to host more events, um, possibly receiving some additional maintenance, and also the addition of better accessibility and more amenities. So here we're showing a few word clouds that represent common responses that we received on the online survey to the Flint Riverfront restoration, which is still open for responses like Scott mentioned. And we'll have the URL for that survey at the end of the presentation. So for this question, what features of Riverbank Park do you cherish most? Popular responses included um, architectural elements of the park. So the fountain, the maze, river walk, stage, um, also the water itself. This question, what kinds of features should be added to Riverbank Park? Um, 
So common themes emerged in the responses related to adding site furnishings, um, such as lights, benches, tables, um, also added site amenities and art. <clears throat> and so here for the question, what type of outdoor activities would you like to see added? Response is really focused on additional recreational opportunities. So kayaking, biking, walking, um, plus group activities like yoga and live music. Um, and then for responses to how would you like to use Riverbank Park, um, these echoed many of the same themes with respondents emphasizing a desire to use the water um, and also have opportunities for gathering and being with the community, being with their families, like picnicking community features that you see on screen. Um, so I'd like to hand it back to Scott to get into some more detail about the proposed improvements for Riverbank Park. Thanks, Katie. Um, and I'd like to, to start with, um, you know, on the, on the next slide is really why are we doing this project? Um, and, and just touch on that. And because it's, a, it's an important piece of um, why we're all here. And, and it really started with Hamilton Dam being a high hazard dam. Um, at one point, three years ago, you know, before it was removed, it was one of the, the two or top two or three worst condition high hazard dams in the state. Um, so there was really a need to, to remove it um, and remove those barriers within the river. Um, and, and essentially, you know, at the same time, control flooding. Um, and, and there's an existing drop uh, that exists uh, in the water elevation between uh, Hamilton Dam to Faber Dam that, that needs to be made up with a gradual transition um, of, of kind of the, um, the river bottom over that downtown stretch. Uh, that distance is about six feet uh, that we are proposing to um, make up over a series of in-river riffle structures. Uh, and in doing so, I mean, we're trying to control flooding and, and keep flooding at um, the limits that, they're, that it's at right now and, and not exacerbate that. Um, and, and improve habitat is something that goes um, hand in hand with uh, the naturalization of this river um, in, in the creation of these in-river riffle structures, as it really provides a, an opportunity um, for, for fish um, to move up river and spawn um, an additional habitat within the river. And at the same time, by removing these barriers, we're uh, improving river recreation. Um, kind of the saying that, that fish go upstream and, and, and people and, and kayaks and canoes are able to now go downstream too without those barriers. Um, so, so that's the kind of the, the reason why um, we're talking about um, Riverbank Park and the Flint River. Um, and you'll see on the next slide that um, really what we're doing by removing these barriers is we're doing a pretty awesome, um, it's an awesome stat of, of opening up almost 25 miles of um, river length for fish passage. Um, that that's also the, you know, additional length that's, that people can, um, can kayak without those barriers now too, um, to, you know, without having to portage. So it's really, uh, an improvement that we're providing, um, for habitat and for, for on the environmental side, that's, that's really pretty amazing. Uh, we do want to show this video. Uh, we did show it in the last engagement session. Um, it is a little bit hard to, to uh, show exactly what an in-river riffle structure looks like um, by, by me describing it. So this, this river is, it gives you an example of what uh, the actual river could look like um, kind of you know, within the water's edge. Obviously the, the surrounding landscape is, is much different uh, in downtown Flint than what's shown here. But uh, what we wanted to point out is those in-river um, boulder clusters and, and small riffles or rapids are, are very um, similar to what we would be, what you'd see once this um, Flint River restoration project is completed. And then the, the next item that uh, goes hand in hand with the in-river riffle structures is actually how people are gonna get in and out of the, the river um, and at each of these riffle structures, we've created opportunities um, where we're cutting the seawall and where we're allowing an ease of access in and an ease of access out of the river. 
Um, and this is in addition to um, improved uh, self-rescue locations along the banks of the river, uh, where we're gonna improve those, those ladders that exist today and many that are non-operational. Um, but really, you know, the red, red star locations are, are kind of the, the major access points that we're creating with this project from, from land to river. So that brings us to uh, the, you know, the improvements that will be happening to Riverbank Park. And I'm sure uh, many of you are, are very, very familiar with it. Um, and, and when it was constructed uh, in the late 70s and uh, being in, constructed by uh, famous landscape architect, Lawrence Halprin, um, it was you know, an integral part of a flood control project that was undertaken by the US Army Corps of engineers in the 70s. Um, it's really characterized by these angular trapezoidal concrete walks and canals, and um, which is softened by the, the surrounding landscape. Um, and it's really comprised of, uh, it, you know, the four downtown, five, actually six downtown uh, blocks over that about third linear mile along the riverfront. Um, each of these blocks is kind of interconnected outdoor rooms and on distinct terraces with, with changes in level and really unique experiences um, throughout each block that stepped down to the water's edge. Uh, the Grand Fountain is, is probably the most notable uh, that exists. And it was, um, it's located on the Northern Bank, west of, of Saginaw Street. And it was uh, in this inverted stepped uh, structure that was predicated on the Fibonacci series of proportions. Uh, it's a really uh, amazing, um, piece of architecture that, uh, especially when the water is, is running. Uh, so going to our uh, project goals and benefits, and this is very similar to what you've seen um, with the overall Flint River Restoration Project, with some additional goals and benefits that we've been identifying as we've been going through this process. And one of the ones that I want to uh, note right now is that preservation and, and kind of enhancing of the existing character. Um, we, we've been listening and, and have heard um, through all the engagement to date that, you know, how important that parts of uh, Riverbank Park are to everyone on this call. And so um, that is something that we've been trying to do and as well as um, at the same time achieving the other project goals. As we started to look at the actual con conceptual design of, of River Pink Park, um, we started to identify some defining components um, within each block uh, and, and how it's used and, and kind of potential within each block. Uh, so starting with the playground block on the left and, and that being potentially uh, creative play and, and trying to utilize that topography um, coming down from the street level down to, to the river walk um, river access, which is a common theme throughout uh, many of these blocks, as I just noted, uh, and then some recreational opportunities uh, that may exist there. Amphitheater block is, is obviously a huge gathering and event space now. Uh, we think that there's a, you know, that sense of community can be built on and improved. And again, that river access is a critical location there. Actually, that is one of the locations where we felt like we could get probably the, um, you know, like an ADA access point potentially. Grand Fountain Block and, and Water Wall, um, as well as Market Stall were, uh, you know, there was a lot of historic preservation in our minds as we were starting to look at those blocks. Um, and then Grand Fountain, uh, obviously it's a more active space, especially when the fountain is running. Uh, we've, we felt like there was an opportunity to bring food and drink in and it being a, a, a potential location um, to do that, and then river access at that block as well. Water wall and market stall are um, one thing that's different from the other blocks is that there is not a in-river riffle there. Um, so we're able to preserve a lot of the existing architecture there. Um, we are proposing to do some, some changes on market stall to make a little more open and flexible at the water's edge to um, en enhance that green space and, and make it more um, inviting from a, a river access. Point. Uh, and then Archimedes Screw, um, looking at, at the river access again, is that's the largest in river riffle at the existing Hamilton Dam, um, improving recreation and pro providing some spaces for contemplation, uh, river viewing, 
and, and, and the like. And so our, our next um, slide is, is coming up, um, potentially. I'm we not have sure some... what's happening. <clears throat> Hopefully our, our technical difficulty won't last long here. We have some images that um, we're hoping that you all get a chance to kind of click on. Um, we'd like to, you to provide your input on, on these precedent images that we've kind of thought about and used for design inspiration. Maybe we start with this one and I'll try to figure okay. out the previous one. So he, these are a handful of images and um, you know, we wanted to showcase how certain underutilized spaces uh, could be improved, um, ranging from the top left corner of the existing pedestrian bridge and, and trying to um, improve lighting along that stretch. Um, and to the top middle image, um, there's an underpass between the market stall block and um, the amphitheater block that could be improved with lighting um, and artwork. Uh, and, and that could be either in that form or it could be more of a um, the, the image below it. Um, so if you all could, if you're still on the poll EV, um, if you could click on the actual image, if, you know, if it speaks to you, if you're interested by it um, as a potential uh, inspiring photograph for you that could be used. Um, and Katie, is it, it looks like we're getting some images or some, um, so Mark's popping up, so that's great. Um, there was, during the last engagement session, there was um, a, a lot of discussion on art and um, how we integrate that, whether it's um, you know, a memorial for uh, the water crisis um, or it's, it's murals in different locations. Um, so that is one image that we tried to portray with the lower right image. Uh, and then the lower left image, um, you know, trying to show that this whole riverfront, you know, will be much more activated and, um, you know, lighted and, and more welcoming um, in the evening. All right, excellent. Katie, are you able to get the other slide working? I let's let's see. I don't know what's going on with that one. All right. Well, no, no worries. We can um, we can move on to the, the slide right. after. So when we were looking at the in-river work that needed to occur, we were trying to locate those in-river riffle structures in a location where we were minimizing impact uh, to the existing riverbank park blocks. So what you see here, um, this kind of dashed arrow is the uh, approximate access route that will be used for construction in order to access the river and, and install that, um, that grade control um, in-river work. And so you see that kind of pink area as being the construction impact zone, and then the park preservation and enhancements in, in blue. And so with the, with the Flint River initial project, the, you know, the, the base project will, will really improve and, and restore areas within the, the pink, um, but there will still be other enhancements going on um, in the other blocks that, that are focused on safety, um, such as railing or, or lighting. Um, or potentially site furnishings as well. So we use this idea of, of trying to focus on what, what changes needed to get in and out of the river um, to, to showcase a conceptual design um, that is uh, complementary to um, the work that, you know, the original design. Um, and we've tried to use kind of the forms and the architecture, um, you know, the, the everything from the concrete walls um, to, to the angles and, and the, the thought process on moving through the space um, to depict a conceptual design that, that is uh, complementary to Halpern's original design. 
And, and this is conceptual and, and we're trying to achieve, um, you know, the main access points into the river, um, improving ex ex accessibility throughout the site uh, and, and integrating art, um, providing additional opportunities for, um, you know, in, in a larger audience potentially at the amphitheater uh, and then improving those underpasses and, and making those, uh, those connections uh, feel safer and uh, more welcoming. The next block is the market stall block. And you'll see on the south and the east side, um, there's you know, mostly preservation and enhancements uh, such as lighting. And on the, the, along the river's edge, um, we've looked at, at trying to improve those sight lines and improve the space adjacent to the river to make it more, um, more, more functional for various events. And you'll see on the next slide um, that We've, we've tried to integrate some thoughts from the original design um, in terms of, of a water channel that could potentially um, connect back through um, on this block. Uh, previously, it was going to the uh, amphitheater block, but um, due to a, that, those access locations, that's, that's no longer feasible, but trying to bring back a piece of that, um, the original design uh, into this, this concept. Um, that water channel would, would potentially fill up with water during floods. Um, and then in, in periods of, of downwater, it would be more of a green infrastructure um, enhanced landscape that looks a lot different than the, um, the Phragmites that's in there uh, today. Um, so again, improving uh, fishing access and, and river access um, while, while preserving the um, original block uh, history along the market stall uh, edge and along the bike path on the south. Uh, water wall block is, is mainly focused on enhancement and, and preservation. Um, it would be absolutely wonderful, as you can see in the next slide, if, if the actual water channel was up and running again um, and was part of this block. Uh, I think that's really uh, a huge component of Riverbank Park is, is getting that water up and running at some point because um, it, it just changes completely the space. Uh, we also heard that the restroom um, was a critical piece. And so renovations to that, to get that up and running um, and part of this block. Uh, and then simply enhancing seating and providing some more interest um, uh, throughout the block, as well as enhancing the opportunity for fishing along the river. The river excuse me, the river walk. I do wanna to add to that as we're going through um, these, these proposed improvements, we've tried to take uh, everyone's thoughts from the public input and, and some of those um, words from the word cloud that were, were used the most and tried to por portray them and, and show them how they apply to um, the, the construction areas that are being impacted and improved. So the next block is Grand Fountain block and um, the construction impact zone um, has been limited to the, the east side of this block. And with, with the thought that the character defining elements of the Grand Fountain block are really on the west half of this block. And there's really just the, um, the terrace uh, and and kind of walkway ramp going down on the east half. Um, we are trying to preserve some of that overlook and some of that uh, second level um, with the, the, the conceptual design as shown on the next page. And we tried to integrate some ideas of, you know, improved accessibility, enhanced seating, um, potentially an opportunity to, to bring food um, and, and have some kind of element or some kind of building or, or food truck or some opportunity to um, bring that component to this block and provide an opportunity for people to sit and have lunch next to the water, um, hopefully with the, the water running at, at some point in the future. Um, it would be a really unique space and a, another draw for people to go down to Grand Fountain Block. Um, so moving on to the, the playground block, and this block is, is much more of an open slate uh, when it comes to 
um, what is there today? I mean, there is an outdated, outdated playground um, that's closer to uh, uh, Beach Street, uh, but, but mostly it is mature landscape and, and lawn area and, and river walk that exists on, on the south side of the river. And then um, river walk and, and some mature landscape on the, the north side of the river here. Uh, so you can see the construction impact areas. Um, and we feel like there is more of an opportunity here to um, enhance the rest of this green space um, with things that were mentioned during previous uh, engagement sessions. As you'll see on the next slide, um, that could be anything from pavilions or shade structures, um, a playground, uh, a bathroom on the south side of, uh, of the river. Um, you know, if, if the one was renovated and updated on the north side, uh, we heard a lot that there was, it would be great to have multiple bathrooms within the space. Um, and then the opportunity to do other kinds of, you know, small games or, or exercise um, or typical park activities within this linear space. And again, we have um, two river access points here, uh, one closer to Beach Street and then one on the opposite side of the river uh, at the, the most downstream riffle structure. Uh, and then last but certainly not least is Archimedes Screw Block. Um, on the south side of, of the river here uh, is U of M Flint property. And there will be an access point going in and out of the river at this location. And that area would be restored um, to, to put it back to, to similar uh, to how it is today. And on the north side of the river, there would be um, a couple access points that we're looking at to get um, folks along this entire riffle structure. And we are also trying to provide an opportunity for um, safety response, emergency response to get both upstream and downstream of the riffle structure in the proposed uh, conceptual design. Um, as you see, we've tried to integrate an enhanced river walk, um, potential space for artwork, uh, a pavilion, you know, a space to picnic um, and really enjoy uh, kind of a, a probably the, the prime spot for, for river watching as people come down um, the, the river in kayaks or canoes. So with, with those improvements, we, we do have these base improvements, which are, are really to get in and out of the river and restore and improve um, accessibility and safety. Uh, and enhance the parks. Um, but there's these other components that, um, you know, are, are critical, I think, to the long-term success of the project, uh, but that we don't have funding for everything right now. And so what we'd really love your help with is, is trying to rank um, what's most important uh, to you all. So if you could go back to pollev.com slash COF community and, um, and you should be able to click on these and kind of rank them and move them up or down in your screen. Uh, and then once you get to a good point and you feel comfortable with how you've ranked them, if you hit submit, it'll pop up on our screen. And um, we'll be able to see in this, this res these responses will be tallied everyone's responses. So we'll give everyone a couple minutes uh, or a, a minute or so. And uh, Faith, I saw just ask the question um, to um, provide the link. So again, that's pollev.com slash COF community. And I did put that in the chat as well. We'll give everyone about another 30 seconds or so before we, we move on. Katie, are you able to see the total number of responses? You know, I was just checking. I can see it, but it's lagging a lot. It says okay. that there have only been a few responses and I think that's not accurate.
and we do get a, a final report. So we'll, able, we'll, we'll be able to see um, all of the responses that are submitted um, throughout this session. All right, excellent. Uh, with that, we are going to turn it, or I'm going to turn it over to Nate um, to talk more about the future of, of Chevy Commons. Uh, and just as a reminder, too, we will have that open ended question at the end of, of this section of the presentation. Uh, hello, everybody, and uh, thank you for uh, spending a couple hours with us tonight. Um, maybe I should give you a very brief synopsis of who I am and, <laughs> and who I work for and what we do, because since I'm kind of the, the newbie here, um, other than I will say, I grew up in Michigan. I grew up in Ann Arbor, so about an hour south. Um, so the, there, are, there are lots of things in the state of Michigan that are very fond of my heart. And um, I love being back in Michigan and seeing family. Um, I, I work for Michael Van Valkenburg Associates. We are based in Brooklyn, New York and also in, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, and I think that one of the most rewarding pieces of our practice is to be able to work with folks like you all and um, create public parks um, really for you all and the cities that we've been able to work in. I, we've, we've done quite a bit of work in New York. And then over the last 10 years, our, our practices started to move out to other parts of the country. And we actually find ourselves in the Midwest quite a bit these days. We were working on a park in Detroit. Um, some of you may know uh, Maggie Daly Park, which is a, it's a roughly 20 acre playground at the very north end of Grant Park in Chicago. Um, and here in New York, if you're ever in New York, um, come visit us at Brooklyn Bridge Park, which is about a mile and a half of waterfront, uh, kind of a stone's throw from our office. So anyway, uh, next slide. But bottom line, we are tremendously excited to start this conversation with you all about Chevy Commons Park. Um, this is a diagram actually from, I think it's from Wade Trim, definitely not from us, but it kind of shows the progression of, of cleanup and restoration that's happened at Chevy Commons over the last 10 years. And I think what's so exciting about this kind of next phase is that we want you all to begin to kind of think big about what this park could be. Um, so again, maybe this is the newbie and me kind of uh, just talking through the kind of basics of this um, with you all, but the park is bound by Kersley and Glenwood and then the Flint River. And you have neighbors of Atwood Stadium and Kettering University um, kind of on the, on the opposite side of the river, Stevenson Avenue, Chevrolet Ave Boulevard, I think, uh, cut through the site. Uh, those are, so those are kind of the, the, kind of the, the, the lay of the land. So the thing that's amazing about this site is that it's 60 acres of parkland. And it's pretty rare that communities get to rethink what 60 acres of parkland is. Um, so you have a tremendous asset on the banks of the Flint River. Um, and I think what hopefully through the conversation that we all have tonight, the amazing thing about this space is you actually have room to do lots of different things. And so what we'll do is we'll show you some precedent images of other projects that we've done kind of as to be aspirational, but also just to kind of get your creative thinking going and kind of help us launch into this. So also, so you know, we don't come to this with any sort of preconceived ideas. We really wanna hear from you all. And I think that's partly what makes uh, park making uh, for cities so exciting. Again, this is your park. And so we're just here to kind of bring those ideas out. So we, I think the other piece of this too is that we'd like to get back in front of you pretty quickly um, with some of these ideas. Okay, so I've talked about, so you have this amazing asset and then you can flip to the next slide. But so let's begin to rethink about what could be added here. 
Um, next slide. Seems like a silly question, but Chevy Commons is not a very old park. So we would like to know, have you been to Chevy Commons Park before? So we're gonna go to the same, same software that we've been using. This is a really quick question, but kind of, again, curious about responses. And I promise you the next question won't be so dull. And it's nice to see that many of you have been there, but it's also interesting that some of you haven't. So um, this will be quite an adventure. Okay, uh, probably good for, for results on this one. So let's, let's move on. Um, okay, so the first thing that we're gonna talk about is making the park a diverse place in all four seasons of the year. And the, the kind of jargon term as, as landscape architects, park planners that we use is we talk about park program. And all that that means is what you'll do at the park. So I'll try not to say the word program again, um, but it's kind of that, it's a, so it's a collection of uses but the amazing things about city parks is that they need to be, they need something for everybody. It can't just be, so what we would like to do is we'd like to build on the trails and the meadows that are there and the trees that have been planted, but begin to think strategically about how we could add some other pieces to this park. And when we talk about kind of diverse landscapes, we often talk about kind of urban landscapes meaning places for folks to gather, places for events, um, but places for community. Um, the other kind of wonderful thing about the size of, the, of Chevy Commons is that you have this amazing asset that could have active recreation. Um, some of the other spaces along the riverfront are a lot more constrained by space and roads and river and walls, but Chevy Commons has lots of elbow room. So, Again, think about activities that you might want to do that are active recreation. Um, we would also kind of like the opportunity to kind of pump up or kind of jumpstart the natural landscape more than is there already. And, in, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in, a little bit later in the presentation. And then also we'd like to bring some civic elements and one of the a, a great kind of civic gathering place in a park is a playground. And so we need to think about kids, we need to think about teenagers. Um, so democratic parks, again, they have lots of different activities for all sorts of folks. Next slide. Um, okay, so we're also gonna show you kind of, so we'll show you three uh, scale comparisons. And on the left side, they're not gonna come all at once, but on the left side is is Chevy Commons. So you can see Atwood Stadium at the, at the kind of the top with the, with the parking lot and then the, the confluence of Schwartz Creek and the Flint River. And then next to it is a photograph of Maggie Daly Park, which is in Chicago. And I think that I'm gonna, I'll mention two things about Maggie Daly Park. So there's kind of that heart shape uh, in that's overlaid uh, in Chevy Commons. And that is roughly a five acre uh, playground. It's a big playground. Um, Chicago is a gigantic place, um, but it really becomes this regional destination for families uh, bringing kids uh, into the city. Um, so next slide. Um, the other piece of that too, which I won't go back and show you, but there is also a, an ice ribbon, which is, as a Michigander, I kind of like cringe at this a little bit, but it, it's, I mean, when I grew up skating on ponds, we just skated on ponds. But the amazing thing about these ice ribbons are they actually have topography. They have, so if you can actually imagine skating up a little hill, skating down a little hill, uh, and then in the summer, it becomes a place that you can roller skate or take a scooter. Um, again, so I'd like you, all, and again, I'm not saying that this is what you all need in Flint, but think big when we start asking you about what you might want to do um, at Chevy Commons. Um, 
So next image is is the playground. So again, this is a this is a five acre playground. It's, a, it's probably the biggest. But it's probably the second biggest playground that we've ever worked on, but it has lots of different uh, challenges for all different sorts of kids. Um, and it really becomes this kind of hub of activity and a gathering place within the park. Okay, moving on. Um, so another type of play to us is active recreation or sport field. So this is another park that, that we've worked on in Philadelphia. And just to give you a sense, I realize that the overlays don't work tremendously well, um, but you can, so the two rectangles and then kind of the pie shaped piece are the size, are, are scale blocks of how big a soccer field or a baseball field would be on Chevy Commons. So again, it's a pretty big place and, and you have opportunities to kind of take advantage of that space. Um, next slide. And I think the thing that's, that's also worth thinking through is just because you have these active, if there are active rec fields, do you want them to have lights? Do you want them to be more casual? So like, for instance, they could be in kind of long meadows and you could have, you know, painted lines, but they could also be for informal play as well. So the next two images are just our photographs of this of this park. It also has lots of kind of interesting infrastructure around the edges, just like Chevy Commons. Um, and again, these, these fields could be nestled in the, in the trees. Obviously, you don't have trees in the fields, but they kind of become these void spaces within the, the trees and the forest that have been started, that have been planted already. Okay, next. Um, we do, I, I did, I did mention earlier, we do want to provide a place for children. And the question that we're gonna to go to in, in a second with the, with, in the polling software is, we're gonna ask you about how, what kind of play you would like to see potentially at Chevy Commons. And we're, there are four kind of different types that we'll talk about. One is nature-based play. And nature-based play, tends to be more informal. It has lots of vegetation. It has, it may have piles of dirt for kids to run around and play on. Um, it's not necessarily what you would think of um, as kind of a fenced off play area. The next is, is water play. And I think in a number of projects that we've worked on, we've, we've worked on water play areas that are not kind of your typical splash pad. They kind of have the character of, of a stream corridor. Uh, there's interactive water. Um, and I guess that's another thing that both the nature-based play and the water play are really great they, for, is that they encourage children to kind of participate with each other and play with each other and work together to do things um, in, in, a, in a civic setting. Last two are the notion of kind of encouraging imaginative play um, and so we, we work with a couple of different playground manufacturers that actually make these kind of wonderful wooden creatures that are actually there have slides coming out of them. This is a, this is a pipe fish uh, of a small playground here in New York City off of the Hudson River. And then the last is we have this, you could also just have kind of playful objects set in the landscape that maybe aren't in a kind of Kind of formal playground setting. Um, so uh, we'll we'll go to the we'll go to the polling software again and let us know your thoughts on nature-based play, water play, imaginative play, and or playful objects. That I realize that there probably aren't too many kids on the phone tonight, if any. But we've all been a kid at some point in our life, or we have kids. Um, and so I think playgrounds are, are, are a really uh, important piece of a public park. Okay. We'll let this go a little bit longer. 
And I have to say, I am, I am a big, I agree with 53% of you. I really like the idea of, of nature-based play. Um, I think it has some, I think it has great potential. And I guess the other thing too, is that we should say is that we don't necessarily only, you know, we can begin to kind of work through multiple versions of play with it within the park or in a playground. So um, thank you. Thank you very much for your, uh, for your responses. Okay, this looks like it's died down a little bit. So let's, uh, let's, let's move on to the next, next slide um, and, and next question. Um, again, when, you know, an asset of the state of Michigan, for instance, is kind of its, it, it's, it's rich four seasons. And summer is always pretty easy with parks. And so I think what we as landscape architects often try to do is try to bring out the spring. We try to bring out the fall and kind of make people comfortable kind of, you know, in the, in those shoulder seasons to summer. And then it's, but we also need to find things to do in the winter. So we'll let this next question go a little bit longer, but what, what we'd like to ask of you is, and we can probably figure out from what your response is, but you can tell us what, what season you're thinking of, but you don't need to necessarily. We would like you to describe your ideal spring, summer, fall, and winter activities. So again, we'll kind of jump back into the polling software. Um, I'm, I'm really interested to see what you all come up with here. Um, and I think that this conversation will be really interesting as we begin to kind of bring all of these ideas together into a, into a concept plan for the park. Okay. Um, and biking, running and walking has been a definite theme that we've, that we've seen um, all through the meeting this evening. Um, and I guess, yep, sledding, that's great, snowshoeing. And I also like that you're talking about plants here too. I mean, that's, I guess that's my leaning as a landscape architect, but um, the landscape itself should respond to the seasons as well. And so you should, we need to kind of, when we're thinking about plants and we're thinking about trees, um, it's, it's great to, that you're, you're thinking that way as well. Um, the other piece of this too, I, so but when I was, when I was on the, at the park this summer and you can think small as well, um, what I wanted was a bench with a tree and shade. Um, aha. Um, so don't, we don't just need to think grand here. I think, you know, every, everything's on the table. Okay. These are great. And I also glad to see that the Michiganders are at, are thinking about winter. Okay. Wow, snowmobiles, all right. All right, so let's Let's move on and this is great. Thank you, thank you. So kind of building on what we, what a lot of your observations were there actually. And um, so something we would like to do, I mean, the, the restoration efforts to date have been kind of Herculean and the transformation of over the last, let's say 30 years of, 
what Chevy Commons is now is, is quite remarkable. And I think what we would like to do is we would like to kind of push that a little bit further. And so next, next slide. Um, this is kind of, this is the way that the park looks today. This is kind of the park. And so something that, but something we would like to do is that we would like to use, we have these kind of very simple and kind of, it, they're almost, they're almost kind of funny tools as landscape architects, but we like to use dirt and we like to use plants and we like to use water. But so it's, so what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to rethink some of the topography, some of the landscape here to kind of amplify the natural landscape that's there. We may try to make some pieces of specific or maybe some areas that are slightly more paved. But I want to show you one example. And this will be our the last scale comparison tonight. And so this is a this is a park in, in Toronto. Again, the whole park kind of fits in that same area that we were looking before. Um, and this park has a playground, but it also has a constructed wetland that's perched on top of a kind of, of a cap site. Um, and then to show you that, again, the images that follow, but they, they also started in a, in a very similar place to uh, Chevy Common. So this is, this is Corktown Common in Toronto. Um, it's also a brownfield site that had a lot of remediation work done and has also a, a very uh, significant work on it. So it actually has to perform environmentally. Um, but what we were able to do there, again, with these with dirt and plants and a simple set of paths are the next two images. So this is, this is an aspiration that we have in Chevy Commons. Um, again, it's it's pretty simple, um, but it's it's a perched wetland with a lot of native plants. I think this kind of ties back into a lot of, um, someone just had a comment. Is it my mic is bad? Yeah, it's it's getting a little fuzzy at times. I don't know if strange. I'll turn up my volume. Thank you for saying something. It's almost like shuffling papers, is what it sounds like. Might be doing that too. <laughs> <laughs> I'll stop. <laughs> okay, so then this is this is the perch wetland that's on top of the uh, of the cap site in Toronto. But again, you kind of see that um, this is this is late summer. You can see the golden rods, but um, kind of the the birch trees that are growing up through that. So um, the question, and I, I'll, I'll, I'm going to show you two examples here, and then we will go to the poll. Um, I would like you to tell us what your favorite landscapes, and they can be a park, they can be a natural landscape um, in the state or the region. Uh, this is the Formar uh, Nature Preserve. And then the next image, which I'm just going to just a little insight into my own uh, Michigan experience as a kid. Um, are the Lachino Islands. And obviously we're not gonna recreate the Lachino Islands, but there are cues from nature, there are cues from the natural landscapes that we all enjoy um, that I would just, you know, I, I would love to hear from you all um, some examples that are meaningful to you. Um, and we'll see what we can do with that as we begin to uh, think of ideas for the park. So again, this is when you actually have to type in, it's not, it's not, it's not clicking, but um, I'm always, I think the, the responses will be uh, really interesting. Wow, where is Cone? What is that, Cone Toto? All right. These are great. Yeah, they are. 
as long as we don't have water, the color of the water coming over to Kilometer, right? In the flow. <laughs> Beautiful. I know Gallup Park very well. Cool. All right. There's some new parks here to me too. So I, I'm, I'm excited to look these up. Excellent. All right, we went out of state. Good stuff. <laughs> All right, thank you, thank you. All right. Okay, so let's see, we're getting all right, I'm going to keep going, and we can we can continue this at the end also. Um, so I think I briefly touched on this earlier, and then so again, one of the assets of Chevy Commons is how well it's connected to two regional bikeways, and probably more than that, kind of in the kind of near vicinity. There are bus routes that are nearby. Um, the river. And so, I, but I've, what, what would be helpful for us to understand, and again, this is not a long part of this presentation. So the next, you can go to the next slide, which kind of begins to map all of these <coughs> systems together. So the, the light, kind of that chartreuse or the screechy green are the, are the bikeways. Um, there's a, and then the Iron Bell Trail, which is coming um, close by, and then the bus routes. But I think that something that would be helpful to us in thinking through the park is how would you like to travel to Chevy Commons Park? Would you like to walk, bike, drive, or take a bus? And we ask this question kind of in terms of beginning to think through park entries. Glad to see we have some transit users also, that's great. As a New Yorker, I, I kind of forget what a car is sometimes. <laughs> You don't have, you can say you're, you're, you can drive because I under, that's how I got there also. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's, it's, it's pretty fascinating to see um, walking and biking are high numbers too. So that's great. So one of the things that we'll, we'll have to think through over time is, is the parking that's there adequate for what might be there in the future. All right, uh, that was a quick one. So we will move into to the last piece of this, um, which is engaging the river. And as you know, I think as many of you noted earlier, how important kayaking was to you all. Um, we have, a really, uh, so you can go to the next slide again, which is kind of mapping kind of the river and where the, where the flood lines are and kind of, but I think, so then going to the next, the next photograph, um, we have a really interesting um, site condition at Chevy Commons, which are the concrete embankments that I didn't realize, Scott, that the that the Riverbank Park was kind of associated with this work that the Army Corps did as well. Absolutely. Um, so one thing, one observation is that often when you're at Chevy Commons, you don't really know that the river is there. So it would be nice to make the river more present. Um, and we can do that with landscape and not necessarily even touch the river itself. Um, but it would be nice to know from you all how you would like to engage the river at Chevy Commons. And so the, 
the next, the last, the last uh, three photographs I'll show you are all from Brooklyn Bridge Park. And the reason I'm showing them is that it's possible that we rethink how you engage that edge, that concrete edge at Chevy Commons in, in multiple ways. So all of these examples show the edge at Brooklyn Bridge Park, but kind of repurposing the infrastructure that's there in a new way, which allows people to, in, in this case, kayak in the East River. But in this case, we're kind of preserving seawalls, we're adding some, some riprap, um, but again, we're allowing people to have easier access. So next, next slot, next photograph. Um, again, this is a peer structure that's there that we've repurposed for basketball. Slightly different than kayaking, but I, I, like, I always kind of like the notion of kind of repurposing things that are left on a site. Um, and then the last photograph is a, is a boat ramp. Um, again, it's not green, it's not, it's not soft, um, but again, it allows people um, to have access to the river. So let's put our thinking caps on about how we engage the river at Chevy Common. Um, it's, you know, it, it could be kind of an interesting combination of hard and soft. Um, it's, often a, it, it's often a hard question to kind of grapple with, um, and it's an even more difficult question to grapple with when it comes to funding and things like that. But we have the opportunity to like think into the future here and it may be something that we can tackle in the future. Um, okay, so there are two more uh, polls to take. And again, this is one of those slides that you can actually click on the images. So the question is, What's the most important thing to add to the Flint Riverfront now? So there's two of these. We invite you to click away, tell us what you like. Um, and then we're pretty close to wrapping up the, the presentation. Kayaking is still a very popular activity. And who doesn't like a good barbecue? It's good. All right. All right. If probably, there's probably more clicks than people at the meeting. So we can probably, we can probably go, not that you only had to pick one either, um, but we can probably go to the next series of images. All right. And again, you'll see, we put a lot of kind of winter recreation in this. Um, the kind of abstract photo in the top row, second to the right is actually a, it's a skateboarding park. Um, sorry if it's a little too, too abstract. guy bird watching in the upper right corner on a civic lawn. There was a lot of talk about cross-country skiing earlier, so I'm glad that we seeing some things similarly here. Okay, uh, 15 more seconds to click away. All right. Okay, so then I believe this is our last question. And this is this is kind of an interesting one that you, yeah, all right, you guys are on it. And just remember, I think the thing that we'd like to remind everyone is that there are also, there are lots of river access points that aren't necessarily at Chevy Commons. Um, but I think that this, the question also kind of is 
or more of the river, but just keep, think big on this one. And remember to think for the kids that aren't at the meeting and the teenagers who are doing homework <laughs> at practice. <laughs> All right. It's nice to see some responses still coming in. So someone just asked a question in the chat, how many more engagement sessions there will be? And I'm probably not the one to answer that. Um, I know there will at least be one more um, and, and definitely the potential for more beyond that as, as things progress. Okay. Uh, looks like the responses have slowed down a bit, but and that again, thank you all for clicking away, typing because we do we we truly want to hear from you all about all of this because this is this is your park. Okay. Uh, we do not, I do not have any more slides. I don't know if there's any more at the end of the deck that, that you all, that you all have Scott. Um, but I nope. think at this point, what we wanted to do is kind of open it up. Um, if you wouldn't, I don't know if you can unmute yourselves and, or you can ask questions in the chat and we'll try to respond both ways, but we have, we have roughly 30 more minutes of time. You don't have to take the rest of your evening. Um, but if you have any sort of burning comments that you want to share or thoughts, I'd love to hear you. And we welcome you to, um, if you wanted, wanted to have more of a discussion on and, and ask a question, you know, I think you can, yeah, you can raise your hand, um, and we can unmute you and, you know, we can have more of a conversation. Um, uh, so looks like Cade, uh, raised his hand first. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, yeah, I, uh, thank you very much. I have kind of three main responses that have been running through my head. Um, I can definitely see from the last time we all chatted that um, you guys uh, made some big changes and I feel like um, I feel like a lot of us were heard, so I appreciate that. Um, the first thing I wanted to say um, is uh, sort of probably some unavoidable conversation, but um, we are talking about having to dismantle essentially a, a park, Riverbank Park, dismantle aspects of it because they were not able to be maintained over the years. And that lack of maintenance led to them being deteriorated. Often that condition was um, uh, uh, then taught, or uh, we were told that that was the reason why the park uh, had to be changed after that. And then now we're also talking about adding new sort of complicated things to a new park space in Chevy Commons. So, um, including like removing the uh, ice skating kind of element from Riverbank Park, but using an example of something we could add to Chevy Commons. So um, I want there to be all of these elements and I want us to have big, complicated, wonderful facilities, but um, just understand that that's going to hit our ears and some of our ears in weird ways. And obviously the need for um, a, a real maintenance plan and maintenance dollars on the front end to sustain that is, is super important. Um, my second thought uh, is about the just the aesthetic of the design itself. Um, I uh, my my personal feeling is that the reason why Riverbank Park is very exciting or was very exciting to me is because of just how bold it was. Right? It was nothing That's was going to Many would argue. It, in fact, me at it, it, certain spots in that park would argue that it's uh, a bit a bit much. Right? But it's like really intentional. It's big okay. and uh, optimistic and kind of what they were going for. So. I would hope that anything that is done to sort of mirror what is there is sort of done with that same level of like commitment. So, you know, no half measures in that from where I'm coming from. I'd love to, to see that be yeah, as big is. as possible. Um, and then uh, lastly, I'm thinking with the, um, 
the placement of things like uh, you, you mentioned the uh, opportunity for like a food building or something like that, or cafes, pavilions and stuff. Um, I sh certainly can see uses for those uh, definitely in, in the like Chevy Common stuff, but also potentially in Riverbank Park. But um, I also think that land is so precious and can be so uh, des designed really lovely in a, in a really lovely way. And maybe we could rely more on um, better zoning and better partnerships with property owners adjacent to that park to offer the same types of um, uh, land uses or the same types of programming of, of food and, and stuff like that, that we would also get from, you know, installing an actual uh, food service building in the space. And I think that kind of goes for some other things as well. Um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Absolutely. And I, I think we, we have heard um, and we received some feedback last time, um, you know, that was sent to us via email too, about kind of the surrounding uses and how to improve those. So I think that's a really good point, Cade, um, about that. Um, that we'll, we'll definitely take into consideration, you know, because there is only so much space available in Riverbank Park uh, itself. Um, and, and to speak to the, the maintenance side, um, there we have been talking about this in, you know, it is something that we're looking at long term and trying to set up an endowment for maintenance and, and really do this the right way. Um, so that, it, you know, that it can be maintained long term in, in perpetuity and, and make sure that, you um, you know, it, it's being, you know, trash is being picked up and, and the maintenance is, is completely there. And, you know, there, there's um, every aspect of maintenance is covered from, from mowing um, to, you know, uh, fixing something when it needs to be fixed. Uh, so that's something that, that we are considering and, and trying to plan for um, now uh, well into the future. The, the other thing I, uh, this, this really kind of speaks to your work, Scott, um, but the question of, kind of long-term durability of structures also. And I think that, I mean, you, Cade, you brought up a really good point about kind of uh, aging infrastructure. And I think that our goal uh, kind of uh, across the, the, you know, or, you know, along the river is to whatever we put back, we're going to like, we are going to borrow our cues from nature. We're going to, we're going to go, we're going to install gravity walls, not, not vertical walls, you know, necessarily vertical walls that, you know, they, you know, things because structures do fail. But I think if we, if we can be smart about how we approach those edges and we, and we really do, we look to nature, we look to kind of um, just kind of easing things off. I think that in the future, um, we will kind of, we will greatly reduce uh, maintenance burdens on those, on those water structures. It's, it, it's a great point. And thank you for bringing it up. Uh, it looks like we, um, Kason, you, we unmuted you next. So if, if you wanted to share your, your comments and questions, we'd, we'd appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, the one thing I was thinking about with the kayak launches, as well as the um, kind of the yoga area is maybe even a, a sort of like a dock, right? almost like a pier where you could walk out and in, into the water. So I think that would be really, really cool. I think it's a great idea also because it, you know, as you know, we have to be, we're going to have to be mindful of what things cost and, but that's also something that could happen. And then if, you know, future kind of restoration could happen at the same time, but you're still kind of providing access to the water that's different than it is now. Good observation. Um, I'd like to bring up one of the comments that was submitted through the Poll Everywhere software. Um, somebody pointed out that Chevy Commons might be an ideal location for a dog park since it's centrally located and already has um, some parking and is within walking distance to a lot of neighborhoods. Yeah, that's a great, great opportunity. Uh, for a dog park within Chevy Commons. There's a lot of, lot of land. So, you know, that's one of the things that's critical for a dog park. Yeah. Um, my name's Lisa Passberg. I actually work in the summers with the Kayak Flint program as well. So I get to spend a lot of time there and in the river and doing water monitoring. One thing I haven't really heard talked about much is an educational element. Um, I really feel like, you know, this river was, horribly abused for decades by the industrial 
stuff that was going on in Flint. And then it bore the brunt of blame for what happened with the water crisis when, of course, it was not an active participant. It was <laughs> as much a victim as everybody else. Yeah. Um, I would really like to see a lot more opportunities for educating residents of Flint about how the health of the river and the environment around it goes hand in hand with the health of the city and resiliency with the river and these parks also reflects the resiliency of our city. Yeah, cool. Yeah, that's, that's a wonderful comment. I think everyone on, this is Joel. Um, I just wanted to make one comment and uh, to the extent that we propose a lot of these cool sort of interventions and, and sort of spaces for people to come, I'm wondering how much at least the plan can also note how important it is to have sort of active edges along this park. Um, and some of that re some of that like vending stuff sort of hits at this, but I think the challenge with Chevy Commons right now is that really on most sides, it's surrounded by pretty low density or even vacant lots. And, you know, even if it's a very cool, well-lit space, if there's not a lot of people in it, we can kind of make it as cool and well-lit, but if you're walking sort of alone through a well-lit space, it still feels kind of unsafe. So. To whatever extent we can note in this, just the, you know, I think the the way that when we look at these other successful parks like Brooklyn Bridge Park, or I actually used to live near that park in Philadelphia that was shown, the things that made those spaces busy were the fact that right next to them were a lot of people living. Um, and unfortunately, just because of a lot of demolition, like Kersley Street across from Chevy Commons is basically all entirely vacant um, right now. And so, however we can call out that this design is great um, and it will be made even better and I think even safer for people, um, the more that it's also surrounded by denser development and activity and that, you know, green space is good, um, but limitless green space is not good in a city. And so we've got a great park here and it'd be good to have it surrounded by by more development. Well, and and, and to your point also, we need to be careful about sight lines and, you know, and just and, and making sure that, that people feel safe. Seeing into the park, seeing through the park, seeing up ahead that, you know, all, all kinds of things like that. Yeah, absolutely. But I, it's a great design. I think it looks really good so far. Thank you for your comments, Joel. Hi, I think I'm next. Um, my name is Crystal Pepperdine, and I am a resident of the city of Flint for over 20 years, and I am the dog park lady. <laughs> so I'm the one who made the comment. I've been emailing Barry and everybody else about how um, I just think that would be such a huge um, amenity to add to Chevy Commons. It really is centrally located. The paths are already there. The dog poop is already there. People are walking their dogs. Let's get some, you know, uh, you know, stanchions installed with the poop bags and all that stuff. And um, I just, uh, it's a personal thing too. My dog of 16 years passed away this May and I really want this to happen in her memory. And I'm willing to help fundraise and I'm willing to get whatever needs to be done. And I'm verbally saying that here. So it's firmly on record and the world knows <laughs> Chris Pepperdine wants a dog park. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Crystal. Um, we've received some comments and questions about the um, the timing of this construction, and I know it's going to be a long sort of phased process, um, but if anyone, Scott, maybe if you could speak to the expected timing of starting construction or, or Nate. So for the, the Flint River improvements, um, you know, we're working through the permitting side of of that project right now. And um, we were, you know, depending on how things go, it could be um, a, a 2022 start, uh, kind of fall, uh, winter 2022 start, or it could be um, more like 2023 uh, spring construction when that actually starts, depending on when the, the permitting um, goes fully through and, and gets approved. I did, I did see a, a comment um, as well about uh, if today's presentation will be available after this meeting. 
And I know it is recorded on YouTube, so you, uh, you will be able to look it up uh, on YouTube to get access to it. I know maintenance was mentioned earlier, but there has there have been a lot of questions about um, making sure that the new elements, when they are built, that there is a plan in place to make sure that um, maintenance is thought of and built into the plan to make sure that everything's kept up and kept in good repair. Um, I'm not sure if anyone can speak to the details on what's being planned for that. I don't think, I don't, well, I, we, I'm not sure we can speak to detail yet, but um, it's, it's an important, it's not an afterthought with design. It, it starts at the beginning. And so your questions are, are well-timed and it's something that we need to keep in the, not even the back burner. It's something we need to, it's something that we always need to be kind of registering our, our ideas off of. Um, so we don't, we don't take those comments lightly. Um. Looks like I can spell. Oh, great. Um, so uh, another um, thing that I um, picked up on when we were chatting um, was the conversation around sort of pathways. And you had that really great diagram of all the different transportation networks. I appreciated that. Um, and uh, when a lot of folks were saying that they wanted to prioritize walking in there, um, I, I live very, very close to the park. So my assumption was those of us in the city walking to it or walking through it uh, when you were having that discussion. And then when you kind of ended that bit with talking about having adequate parking, I think is what I heard, that surprised me. I, had to examine a little bit. Now I, I understand that people might want to come and park in this space to use the park for a walking space. Um, but uh, anyone who's known me for more than five minutes knows that I'm going to advocate for as little surface parking as possible in our, especially in our places like our parks. So I hope that um, that any type of like circulation system or or just yeah the placement of sidewalks and paths is um, considered for um, as transportation infrastructure for people living on the edges. Uh, or people living in surrounding neighborhoods, maybe first and foremost, and then sort of recreational, you know, windy, cute, uh, uh, amorphous pathways and stuff like that. Um, those are great too and, and useful, but um, feel uh, a little less necessary, I guess, for the functioning of yeah. you know, me and my my day to day life. <laughs> you know, to your point on parking, Kate, that you know there has been you know a number of as you're well aware, uh, you know, small lots within Chevy Commons, the kind of the two bookends. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of parking on street at Kearsley right now too. So, yeah. you know, it's, there's a, a lot of parking that we have available to us now where, you know, before we look at expanding. All right, I know we have a lot of questions um, on the poll EV site. Yeah, so I can I can go through a few of those. Um, so one is, will there need to be a significant increase in public safety presence to prevent improvements from being vandalized and also pr protect visitors both day and especially at night? Yes, there will be a, an increase in, in public safety and we're working with um, U of M Flint um, as well as Genesee County to make sure, uh, you know, and, and determine what needs to be added. I mean, I would, I would say also that, you know, I, we, I think we aspire to have more people in these parks than are there now. And that's actually one of the best ways to kind of proactively work toward, you know, avoiding these kind of issues too. Just having more eyes on the park, having more people walking around, more people, doing things in the parks, it, it, that's gonna be your, it's gonna be a good asset. Very good point. It's okay, we would like, we would love, love all the neighbors and we'd also like people from a little bit further away also just to kind of really kind of make these parks, uh, you know, it, part of your central kind of experience of living in Flint. A comment that just came in um, sort of echoes some of the comments that you were making, Nate, about play. It says, one of the most common summer activities I've noted by the residents is fishing along the river. Many Flint parks have improved playground areas, but options for teenagers and all age play is more limited. Chevy Commons provides an opportunity to meet those needs. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's a, 
that's something that's common in almost every park that we work on. It's like the, the really the group of people that are that people hesitate most about is teenagers. But we really want you know we want all everyone to be comfortable in this park. So um, I think we will be looking for to come up with ideas for places for teens to hang out. One of the commenters um, wants to talk about all of the concrete. Um, I think that's specific to Riverbank Park and maybe the water wall block especially, but also throughout the area that we're talking about and mentions that um, these are these concrete slabs are not necessarily things that they value or wanna see preserved. Um, so just to note that the, I think the historic preservation component of the Riverbank Park Piece. I think there are lots of views on that. Um, this person says, I urge you to remove as, remove as much concrete from the waterfront as possible. Is it really necessary to have so much? Yeah, I think there's a, 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 a middle ground there of, of historic preservation and, and opening up some sight lines in, in areas that are not as character defining and, and um, you know, kind of a, a making sure that we're preserving architecture, but also, you know, providing that accessibility and safety uh, along the riverfront. And I, I do want to note too, that the comment about, um, you know, accessibility to, to the elderly, um, you know, it's, as Nate mentioned, you know, it's, this is the, you know, the parks for all ages, you know, we're not trying to be limiting in how we design these. We want it to be, you know, as, as accessible as we can get it. Um, and provide activities for, from, you know, your one-year-old all the way up to, you know, the 95-year-olds that are out there walking the trails, so. Um, someone also just, there have been a couple of comments about, there are a lot of ball fields, sport fields, and Atwood is there. I don't think, I think I should clarify that we're not, we are, we would not advocate for something as formal as as maybe obviously as Atwood, but I, I think it's something that right, it, could, it could be uh, it could be just lawn spaces that are informally used. So, uh, but they could you could kick a ball around, you could throw a frisbee, um, but not not stands and things like that. Um, somebody in the chat asked, is the in-river cement going to be removed? So on the bottom where the riffle structures are being added, will the concrete on the bottom be removed? Um, so if I understand that, that comment correctly, we are removing some of that substructure that's part of those, those dams um, and, and basically providing backfill that's more of a, the natural substrate um, in those stretches of the riverbed. There are a few comments in the, the software about the possibility of needing to pay to visit the park. Um, and also someone commented about the news, the recent news about um, the, the development of the state park. Um, I think that those two questions might be related. Um, I'm not sure if Scott or Nate or um, possibly Amy, I think is on the phone, could, could speak to that. Not the phone, but in the presentation. Hi, this is Amy. Um, yes, I can. Um, just to update everyone, it is not a state park at this point. The governor did announce that she would like it to be a state park. Um, the funding is uh, presented uh, to the legislature at this point. Um, it has not passed. We are all hopeful it, pa it will pass. And if it does pass, then we'll begin to have the city and the county and the state all work together to kind of develop what that will look like. Um, I do know at this point, it's everyone's intent that it always remain free to um, a free park to anyone who visits. So I know that is the intent at this point from, from all parties involved.
there are a few comments that describe different um, sort of landscape typologies. Somebody mentions or asks, are there plans to use wild grasses instead of lawns that must be mowed? Um, and then there's another similar comment asking for the installation of more native plantings with possibly an educational component about what all is being installed. Um, I can, go yeah, ahead, Nate. No, I was just gonna say, as far, I mean, it's really early in the process. So, but, you know, we're, I think we will kind of consider all, um, I mean, obviously we've talked a lot about maintenance. And so the notion of kind of having, you know, native grasses that don't need to be mown. I mean, we'll, let's put it in our, in our, in our bag of ideas and, and see how that shakes out. And there's, there is a lot of that at Chevy Commons now. Yeah. Uh, you'll, you'll see a lot of the areas that are, you know, taller grasses are intentionally um, not mowed because they're native and they're, you know, mowed down a couple of times a year. Um, so that, that is intentional out there at Chevy Commons. And I'm, I'm sure we'll have um, some form of that uh, as it moves forward still. Yep. Looks like we have another hand up. Um, Holly, if you could unmute what looks like you have. Yeah, this is Representative Martin. Is that who you're calling on? Yes. Yes, I just want to give uh, my two cents worth on the uh, uh, latest on the state park uh, uh, portion. The Natural Resource Committee, which I have sit on, has passed the uh, DNR's land use, land use uh, plan. Uh, the land use plan includes an urban uh, state park. Um, we uh, are quite positive that that is for Flint, and I have put in my request for the appropriations for the uh, for the funding for that. Um, so that looks like it would happen. Uh, as far as I know, just briefly, uh, it's not. I'm not the final authority on this. I'm not DNR, just on the committee. I believe it'd be a passport type park uh, without a, a gate fee. Um, so just like any state park, you need a passport and a license plate probably because it would be a state park. But I think that as far as it would go, as far as fees, but it is the land use has planned is passed the committee and the appropriations has been requested. Thank you very much for that update. Um, there was a question in the Zoom chat um, that we mentioned that there's one more session that is planned. And the question is, are you actively designing using this input and will there be more engagement around the final design? Uh, I think on, on both, you know, the overall project and Chevy Commons and, and Riverbank Park, um, absolutely, there'll be, there'll be more engagement. And uh, as Nate mentioned, um, you know, we wanna use this input, uh, especially since it's the first, first first bit of new input on Chevy Commons and kind of turn around at a upcoming session pretty soon and really share what we heard and, and show some ideas there. Uh, and, and feel free to chime in, Nate. No, I mean, I'll just, yeah, echo the same. I mean, we're, this was, this was really helpful. I think that the next one, the next meeting will be more exciting for as far as sharing ideas. And uh, so we're looking forward to seeing and hearing you all very soon. Um, the question that just came in, are you in dialogue with the U of M Flint about ways to use the river walk and riverfront more for student life? Um, we are, so the project team does include representatives from U of M Flint and they I think might even be on this call. Um, but if you have, if you're a student or staff member at U of M Flint that you have specific feedback, we also like to hear from you about that. All right, we've got just over five minutes left um, for the planned session. I, I don't know if there's other additional questions, Katie, that we can answer that came in early. Um, yeah, there are a few. So one question is, is pretty specific towards the river access that's proposed for Riverbank Park 
currently in the conceptual designs. And the comment is, um, it would not be, it might not be a good idea to install put in areas near the riffles or in fast moving water areas like the stage area. And Scott, you can probably speak to that, but I also wanted to mention in those designs, I think the idea is to propose a variety of um, access opportunities. So some might be above the riffles, but some would be below and, and give a lot of options for users. Absolutely. Yeah, and we're, we're trying to um, design those those edges so that they are um, safe access in and out, um, doing it so the, so kind of the riverbed transitions up gradually to that edge. And, um, you know, so there's not a drop off. There's, you know, it, it's a ideal location if someone needs to get in and out of the river. Um, and, you know, you might be, have, have visited amphitheater block and tried to access at that point and, and have seen that there's, a, there's, a decent drop uh, there at that block. And so we're, we're trying to avoid um, that condition and really make it a safe access point in and out um, of the river. Um, I wanna mention a comment that came in earlier. Um, someone said, I would love to see the intentional avoidance of anti-homeless structures. Um, and I don't think that the design for either location is far enough along to be to that level of detail, but we'll definitely keep that in mind. And then I also wanted to point out another question in the chat related to the state park. The question is, will the state be using these designs and this information if we're successful in becoming a state park? Oh, Amy answered, great. Yes, they are aware of these plans. Okay, thank you, Amy. There are also some comments about the contamination that's present and the commenter asks, will the concrete that holds back contamination be repaired and maintained? I think that's probably referring to Chevy comments. Uh, definitely something we'll have to look into. But, you know, human safety is paramount. So that's, <laughs> That would it will not be compromised. <laughs> yeah, and a similar question came in. Um, is there a plan for the mud that will be deposited at access points? And this isn't quite similar, but is there a plan for the mud that will be deposited at access points and in infrastructure when the river rises and falls? So so that'll tie directly to the maintenance activities that would be planned um, as part of the you know, the long-term and short-term maintenance for Riverbank Park, as well, as well as, as Chevy Commons, if there's any flooding that occurs there. There are a few other comments, um, not, <clears throat> not questions so much, but I'd just like to mention them quickly. One commenter says there needs to be a memorial to the sit-down strikers to preserve the history of Chevy in the hole. Um, which is now Chevy Commons. Um, commenter reminds the project team to be sure to include neighbors like U of M Flint, Kettering, MCC, and Michigan State, um, which I think is, is definitely being done, but that's a great reminder always. Um, also, somebody said they would love to see more of the natural floodplain restored along the river um, and integrated with the new park designs. Um, like that water channel that was discussed. I think that's referring to the market stall plan. And I think that that sums up most of what has come in. But if I missed you, um, raise your hand. I, I didn't mean to. And we also have record of all of this too. So. Right. Yeah, so there was a question about that too, actually. So we, we do have record of all the question answers that came in during the session even if you submitted something after we were on to the next slide, that, that's all being tracked. Um, and like Scott said, the presentation itself is going to be available on YouTube. I'm not sure if all of the Q&A and all the results are going to be available. I'm not sure if there's a plan for that yet. And um, there is an, another opportunity to um, my email address and Nate's email address is at the end of this presentation. So if there's 
additional comments or questions, or you know, if you want to have a conversation about something um, that's related to the project, we're, we're definitely open uh, in, in all ears to hear hear what everyone has to say. Um, in that I'll, regard. I'll move forward um, in just a second, but the riffle structures are intended to be navigable by kayaks. So here are those email addresses. And also um, the public engagement survey that's online is still posted and still live. And the URL is, is on this uh, page here, the surveymonkey.com slash r slash Flint Riverfront. And you can also get to it through links from the Genesee County Parks page and the flintriverrestoration.com page. Well, thank you everyone for your time tonight. We really appreciate the two hours you gave us and, and all your thoughts and opinions. And um, we hope that you're able to attend our next upcoming session. Yeah, thank you everybody. Have a great evening. Ali, could you end the recording? Yes. Okay. The um, YouTube video is running like three minutes behind the live stream. So Melissa said she thinks we can stop it. <laughs> but she's a little nervous <laughs> and can cut off the end. So I'm just going to let that run. All right. If that's okay. Yeah, so we should we we should probably end so we don't have uh, random comments on there then. Right. Yeah. No problem. All right. Thanks. Thank sorry. Everyone. Sorry about the beginning. Oh, but great we job. It, we got it going. So good save. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. <Bye>. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Bye.